This is the first webinar for 2024 from Principal Wealth Partners. It is titled Closer to Normal. I'm joined by Bob Paolucci, our founder and CEO. Bob, this is a whole new year. Yeah, happy new year. Happy new year. So new year. I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, uh, I'm happy to be in the new year because I think it's going to be a great year like uh, last year was. Yes. Um, so it should be a very happy new year. Yeah, I was, I was, took the words right out of my mouth. However, I do, we do think it'll be a slightly different year than what we saw last year. So let's get into this. I want to quickly review a, a few keynotes from 2023. We want to talk about how Wall Street got it wrong. Uh, we want to look back at our outlook from Principal Wealth Partners for the year. We want to discuss rolling recessions and recoveries and where we believe we are with that. Inconsistent data and how that defined last year and the volatility that it created. And then we're going to talk about how the Fed was right, but back in 20, 2021 with their transitory uh, definition of inflation. We are then going to look ahead into this year and we want to address what we believe matters the most. We're going to talk about the direction of interest rates, earnings. We're going to talk about dry powder on the sidelines, meaning the hordes of cash that we see. And then we're going to quickly go through the equity and fixed income themes. And believe it or not, we are in another election year. So we do need to start addressing that and how the markets react. I'll kick off the review of last year. Just to quickly highlight, in 2022, cash was king. There were only two asset classes that were positive. Cash was up a whopping 1.4%. And then believe it or not, commodities had a very good year. But in fairness to commodities, they were probably the worst place to be after 20 years with the most amount of volatility. So they were probably justified their due. But not surprising, they had a terrible year last year in 2023 as everything else recovered in a very broad recovery. We're going to talk about it. Most of it was driven by large companies and growthy names, but that is that really is the, the the stage that we're setting going forward. If that's fair, Bob, that's fair. Yeah, and you can see there's um, consistency if you look at this chart. Um, bad years are usually shared uh, by many asset classes, and good years are usually shared by many asset classes. Part of that has to do with uh, you know low interest rates making everything highly correlated uh, over yeah. the past decade, uh, we think going forward, there will be less correlation, which is a very good thing, better for diversified portfolios going forward. Yeah, for sure. And I think that this is the, this is setting a really good stage for the next slide, which I know you're a big fan of, Bob, because candidly, Wall Street did not call the returns that we saw last year. I absolutely love this slide because um, the amount of time that investors, our clients, people, us to a degree, spend listening to quote unquote professionals talk about their forecast for the future um with very little backup data and rationale as to why they think you know things are going to go the way they're going to go the professionals were wrong again uh this past year the average forecast was for the market to not rise coming out of 2022 and oh boy did the market rise uh, and again, this is an aggregate grouping of pulling all of the big Wall Street firms together and aggregating their, you know, average level for various markets. We're showing you the big one, the S and P 500. They they were on the other end of the spectrum when it comes to you know what actually happened and what they forecasted. It it couldn't have been more different. So spend less time listening to hedge fund managers and billionaires and um, you know, professional market forecasters. Uh, it, a lot of that is just hot air marketing um, and things can change very quickly. Yeah, one of the things we pride ourselves on as an independent firm is we have our own research, we have our own um, beliefs about the market and we don't always agree with Wall Street and last year was certainly one of those years. So what you're looking at here is a slide that we showed you in January of 2023 for our outlook, which was not in line with Main Street, which was, we talked about weakness to strength. Uh, in fact, and this was very deviant, inflation we believed was low and set to go lower. Interest rates, we believed that cuts were eventually coming. We talked about consumer resiliency and confidence. 
We talked about going from a bear to bull with valuations that were attractive and corporate earnings that were not as bad as expected as Wall Street. And then finally, we talked about higher income was going to be more than people believed and how these yields would be attractive and entry points for the market. And we, as always, we love talking about dividends and buybacks and the strength that it has in the market as well. Uh, one last point is we did talk about the recession. We did not believe that we were going to enter a recession. And if I can maybe take that one step further, this is a discussion that is ongoing. We're, we're coming off of 2023 that was the most discussed recession that never occurred. And the reason that it never occurred is because we believe we were in what's called a rolling recession. There were points of recession in different areas of the market, travel and oil, for example, at the top of the page. Those red dots show those recessions that were earlier on in 2020. And then you had other areas of the market like housing and semiconductor, semiconductors at the bottom of the page. And they didn't enter these recessions until late 2022. So because it was so rolling, there was never a definition of a recession. And I think the really good news is we're seeing this recovery ever so slowly um, moving forward, if that's fair, Bob. That's fair. I mean, ultimately, if you have a rolling recession, which really just means, you know, you take half of the uh, data, right, whether it be housing, travel, uh, the price of oil, inflation, semiconductors, employment, all the other stuff, you know, we didn't have everything flashing red in alignment at the same time. Uh, what we did have was a lot of green, a little bit of orange, a little bit of yellow and some red. Um, and then you fast forward a couple of quarters, we had uh, some red, maybe a little bit less green, a little yellow, you know, cautionary stuff. Uh, so we didn't have anything lining up. Y you know, you could, you could uh, move the calendar a little bit and draw on a diagonal line. We've talked about this and yeah, I guess you can come up with a recession, but that's not, that's not how you do it. It has to be in alignment happening very close together, typically within two or three quarters. Um, and we just didn't have that. So, you know, our prediction, uh, January of last year was, was correct. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I think another, another area of inconsistency was, was jobs. Perfect chart to show how volatile the data has been. <laughs> you know, it's very easy to view very consistent data and make forecasts off of consistent data. It's very difficult when you have data that is just changing wildly from month to month and quarter to quarter. And what you can see really since 2020, prior to that, you had somewhat consistent data, small ups, small downs. Since 2020, I mean, you had this enormous swing in the information, which it really does create volatility in various markets. So, you know, the major contribution to the volatility that was seen, let's go back a little further, in 2022 was due to the fact that the data was all over the place. So when the data is all over the place, it's harder to predict. When it's harder to predict, Wall Street tends to be super cautious. Uh, they tend to oversell. They tend to be very bearish and they wait to be proven wrong over time. Right. And they have been proven wrong. Yeah. So the data, the, the great thing about entering 2024 is the data is becoming much more consistent where we're phasing out some of these measurements that have captured three years worth of data, four years worth of data, and it's still in the number from the pandemic, of course. Um, now we're getting to um, a period where a lot of the economic data, a lot of the corporate earnings data, it's starting to fit back in that normal range. Even though it's still a wide range, it's much tighter than what we're looking at here. Yeah, fair. And and what's so what's so interesting about all this inconsistency from last year is um, we, we thought it would be relevant to point out because we do realize that a lot of our clients don't just look at the statement at year end, but they're looking at it throughout the year. Throughout and the year, about every day. <laughs> yeah, every day. <laughs> but it creates the volatility in, in the markets within the year. And, and so when you look at the calendar year of last year, it is interesting to note that the majority of the months, in fact, over nine of them, had movement in either 2% 2, 2 plus or minus in, in a direction. And so there was a lot of movement within the year. And it's so interesting that in the fall of the year, you actually had a market drop of 10% within three months. And then just as quickly as that happened and people realized that it did, the last two months were positive 10%. Yeah. 
And yeah. so I think it's always a good reminder that we do have this volatility, but it was unique with the inconsistency last year. Yeah. And in, in this, I know this looks very volatile, but this is a normal year in the market. You had eight positive uh, months and four negative months, one, let's call it flat month. Um, and remember the negative months, uh, I think emotionally, they feel a lot worse than they really are. And a lot of the positive months, um, the average positive months, I, I think that's just your expectation. So you don't weigh it that positively. Sure. Uh, like the November, December months, they really have to pack a punch to make a positive difference. Um, Cause I think, it, you know, when it comes to investing, a lot of people, they want, expect and need positive returns. So they don't, they, it, it sort of meets the bar. Yes. Uh, so I, I think they just don't weigh it properly and the negatives they overweigh. So, but, but here's how it works. And this also tells you don't measure too frequently. You'll drive yourself nuts. There isn't a market that is a variable market that is consistently going to give you positive returns. The positives create negatives. The negatives create positives. You know, if you think about a stock price, a stock price goes on sale, so it goes down. What does that do? It attracts other buyers. Then it gets bought. Price goes up. So you have this up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Right. Uh, measuring over a month or three months or six months or a year, very hard to do. You really should have a multi-year view and measurement system, uh, or at least an internal emotional controlled measurement system to keep you calm, right? So the calmer you are, the more you trust us to allocate money appropriately and the more time you give us, the better results will be seen for everybody. But you, it just, just proves to you, you just can't measure too frequently. In other words, you can look at your statement every day, but don't change your investment behavior based on that. Don't get emotional about it. It is just the way things are processed. Fair. Thank you. And I think one last point was, did the Fed finally get it right? Yeah. All right. So listen, you. I think you all heard about the, the Fed saying inflation was going to be transitory back in 2021. Well, they were right. It's just the impatient nature of media, us, uh, investors, when the Fed says something um, and they put this vague in the future word describing when it will happen in front of us, we want it to happen now. They were right all along. What this chart really does show is that the vast majority of inflation was tied to the disruption in supply chains. So you have that orange dotted line overlaid with our inflation, CPI inflation, and boy, oh boy, are they highly synced to one another, especially in 2021, 22, 23, and uh, soon to be 24. So that supply chain pressure for the most part is is done, and you can quickly see how inflation uh, is coming down with it. So yeah, it, it's uh, kudos to the Fed in 21 for getting it right. Uh, unfortunately, they maybe should have started increasing rates in 21 instead of doing it all in really 2022 20, and a little bit in 23. Uh, but it is what it is. It's behind us now and we're moving on. I think that's a really good review of last year, which sets us for the stage for 2024. So, yeah. So ultimately, there are hundreds of things that move the markets daily, um, weekly, even monthly. However, there are three main things that you really need to measure and observe to uh, help you come up with uh, an, an accurate prognosis for the you know the future of the market here. And these three are usually the top three. And this year, they definitely are the top three. And what matters most in the market, which helps uh, fuel our, our opinion of what's going to happen, number one is going to be interest rates. Uh, because we are starting the year with a level of interest rate set by the Fed that is in something called restrictive territory. So the Fed has brought rates not to a normal level. They have intentionally brought interest rates to an abnormal level, way above where they think they should be. And so far, in a short period of time, we are somewhat, as an economy, tolerating that restrictive level of interest rates. The Fed mentioned in December that they are set to cut rates this year, some point this year. They don't tell you by how much because they don't know either, but that is in their forecast. And now that is in the market's forecast as well. 
So getting to a closer to normal interest rate or the beginning of their path to get us to a closer to normal interest rate, number one. Number two, corporate earnings. The earnings of the companies in the S&P 500 drive, along with interest rates, uh, the direction of the S&P 500. We're going to show you a chart later on that proves this point. If earnings go up, prices go up. If earnings go down, prices go down, period, end of story. Um, so we're going to take a look at earnings, very important. And ultimately, what really enables the market to move is money in motion. More importantly, is there money that can be put into motion? right? So you could have a very good setup with interest rates. You could have positive earnings. But if you don't have investors deploying money into the stock market or into the bond market, well, there's going to be no movement because the market is driven or price is driven by, in an up market, more buyers and sellers. In a down market, more sellers than buyers. So if you have buyers Let's hope they have lots of cash to invest. And we're going to show you later on what that looks like. It might uh, be very shocking to you to see. No, that's great. And I think to to these three points, you know, starting with interest rates first, you know, when you look at the history of interest rates over on the far right, you can see that, that dark gray line uh, ascending into the most aggressive rate hike we've seen, ending last year just shy of five and a half percent. Uh, and now we've paused. And the question, of course, is where do we go from here? So visually, um, there's two things we wanted to share with you. One is what is the market expecting and what is the Fed expecting? Both of them are expecting to cut over the next couple of years. The dark blue line is the Fed telling us they believe they will cut about three times. The market is the green dotted line. They believe they that they will actually cut more than that, possibly five to six times. Either way, we are in a position that we believe there's an opportunity uh, in the markets that are positive for bonds going forward. And and Bob, I know you have a comment there as well. Yeah, the the um, we're in the camp that the the Fed is probably going to cut a little more than what they're saying right now, because what they're saying right now is backward looking, right? Their future forecast for interest rates was using all of the backward looking data. In December, they pivoted. And what they said was, we understand the lagging effects of our data and potentially how it influenced our estimates. And we also understand that when that data is no longer lagging and showing up live in English, once we start to see the next couple of months of data, we will be changing our outlook. Our forecast will change along with it. That is code for the Fed pivoted. And they went from talking about hiking interest rates to now talking about cutting interest rates. And Generally speaking, you're going to hear people on TV talk about the fact that, hey, when the Fed decides to cut interest rates, that's because the economy is slowing. That is nonsense. That is first level thinking. The Fed is moving rates from not normal rates down. They're moving it from a restrictive level down to normal. That is very different. And I don't hear people on TV talk about that enough. When you have a scenario where they're cutting rates from normal levels lower, then it's because there is major economic weakness and stimulus is needed. When you have a Fed that's cutting rates from an emergency level that was way too high in order to help bring inflation down, yeah. um, the Fed can come down a lot faster because they're just getting down to normal. They're not going below normal. And that is something I can assure you they really don't want to do. You know, over the next couple of years, when they finally get rates to normal, they don't want to set the expectation that they're going to go to zero again. They really want to keep rates around two to three percent, somewhere in between there. And we're at over five and a quarter. So I expect them to cut more because they can and because we're at an extremely high level and we're just getting closer to normal. So you will see a Fed that can and has cut more from those levels. Does that make sense? It is. And I think a, a follow-up to that is we can't have this conversation without addressing inflation, right. right? which we also know continues to drop if you can go through that. Yeah. Wonderful chart that's going to be hard to decipher here. But um, what happens is the data on the left 
when the new inflation data is reported, it rolls off. And what happens is on the right, the new inflation data rolls on. So this chart just kind of shifts to the right and it drops off the categories on the left. And what you see on the left, um, just visually, if you look at it, you see a lot of yellow on the top left and down the bottom, you see a lot of red or red. orange. Yeah. So that is the inflation data that is going to roll off as new reports roll on. And what's been rolling on, just look at the entire right-hand side of this chart. It's all green. Not only all green, you actually see a lot of negatives in front of some of these categories. So what's rolling on is significantly cooler inflation data. And we are, I believe, going to see a major drop in inflation in February with the January report coming out in February because the February inflation number is so high, it's set to roll off and a new lower number is set to roll on. And then once again, in March, reporting the February number, right? Because it's stale by a month. Right. Again, we're talking and, about stale data here. And here it is. Here's an easy And that's chart. a better visual of that. Maybe a little bit cleaner than the last slide, which was showing every category, right? Absolutely. So what you're going to see here is almost one full percentage point of inflation is set to roll off. I believe no more than one half a point, uh, potentially a quarter of a point will roll on. It's very likely that in March, mid-March, after the February release of the inflation data, we will have inflation close to 2.7%. I'm very confident about that. So now, stay with me here. We're giving you the data behind our recommendation for the Fed cutting rates a little more than expected. It's because the Fed doesn't want to have interest rates at five and a quarter percent when inflation is half of that. Continuing to move down. Yeah. Short-term yeah. interest rates and inflation should be, you know, right around one another, plus minus a little bit. You can't have a rate for a long period of time that uh, an interest rate that is double inflation. Yeah. That is absolutely ridiculous. And that is actually something that Janet Yellen mentioned in the month of December. Right. Um, she is trying to influence the Fed. You know, the entity that she used to run in the prior administration, she's trying to say, hey, people at the Fed, interest rates are too high. Inflation is much lower. I just want to make sure you wake up and smell yeah. the roses. And she said it in a nice way. But Ironically, a week later, Jerome Powell said, you know what, maybe it's time to stop increasing interest rates and maybe it's time to start cutting. So she has some influence and I hope she keeps opening her mouth and sharing that influence with the Fed because it is needed. Uh, the Fed's going to bring rates down. Inflation is coming down. That will be a theme played out throughout the entire year. Just you wait. For sure. And we appreciate that interpretation. I think to transition, it, uh, we, we can talk about some of the areas of the market uh, that we think are bringing opportunity this year. And one of those, as Bob mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction of this year, is earnings. Earnings are correlated to market return, um, which basically you're looking at here with the price of the market being the light blue line and the dark line is your forward earnings. And you know sometimes the markets tend to look ahead, so they're not perfectly correlated. But over time, as we have said over and over again, earnings drive growth. And then maybe if you can address that with the next slide. Absolutely. So uh, you know, the biggest mover of stock prices is going to be earnings. Um, and what you see here is the total return attributed to various categories, uh, multiple growth, which is, are you willing to pay a premium for stocks or a discount based on their projected earnings and interest rates? Uh, dividends. So, you know, if you if you buy a company that has a five percent dividend, and uh, the total return for the for the stock that you bought of the company returns you five percent, well, then a hundred percent of your return came from the dividend. That's illustrated in this chart. What percentage of the return were dividends? And you have earnings growth. And earnings growth seems to be 
it seems to be, I'm joking, it is the big driver of return, both up and down. And when you look at the cumulative return for the market, it had a 58% return over a four years. So the full year 2020, the full year 2021, the full year 2022, the full year 2023, with 22 being a negative year, it still returned 58%. 42% of that return came from earnings. So this is why we talk about earnings and say it's very important. And it'll only be more important going forward. The great news is earnings are set to increase uh, this year and next year pretty substantially. And we think, uh, generally speaking, the forecast is always very conservative. You know, the analysts who create these forward projections, they they are very conservative. They want don't want to go out on a limb. Actual earnings versus projected earnings. Actual earnings are almost always higher than projected earnings. So another reason to be very positive. Uh, looking forward. Thank you for that. And and we've we mentioned this earlier, but the cash on the sidelines uh, is, and we've talked about this, but the massive amounts, and as we titled this slide, the sidelines and the stadiums are filled with cash. Um, this slide is unique. It actually goes back to 1983. We have shown other slides in a shorter time frame, but to look all the way back and look at the amount of cash that has skyrocketed over the last few years towards the right. I remember back in 2008 in the financial crisis when hordes of cash were created, and now it looks like a little blip on the radar. Right? You could, it barely registers. Yeah, there was such an enormous stockpiling of cash. You can kind of see it if you squint just above the 08 area. It yeah. went from a low level to a higher than low level, which if we scaled it back then would look like a huge mountain. Uh, now it looks like a, a, a blip on the radar here compared to today. So again, the themes that we talked about, the direction of interest rates lower, the direction of earnings higher. And the third one that matters quite a bit is, is there money that can be invested in the markets to move prices up? And if the answer is no, you'll probably just have a sideways market. If the answer is there's more money than we've ever seen on the sidelines, uh, in second place is not even close. <laughs> this right here, what you're looking at, is going to fuel a multi-year bull market, period, end of story, in bonds and in stocks. So generally speaking, money comes out of cash or money markets or short-term treasuries. Uh, even though they're yielding quite a bit now, they're not going to yield as much very soon. Exactly. Um, and money chases better return, Right. Money always finds a home in a better yield or better return over time. Yes, it requires a little bit more risk taking, in some cases, a lot more risk taking, but it tends to always happen always over time. Uh, feels like it happens slowly. It actually happens pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. There is a mountain of investable cash sitting on the sidelines, and as we say, and in stadiums because there's so much that is going to find its way into the capital markets, uh, it already is, uh, but very likely for the next handful of years. I hope it doesn't happen too soon because then you would have a market that just goes to the moon right. uh, and then it runs out of energy. What will likely happen is what has happened uh, throughout time. It slowly finds a home in the market and props the market up. Yeah, so You're gonna have a lot of this money invested. Uh, this is making us very optimistic, not only for this year, but potentially for years to come. And one quick note before I switch slides, this is just consumer cash. This it's consumer cash. Good good point. Good right. point. If you look at commercial cash or corporate cash, which is also rising because um, companies are pension funds want to buy higher yielding securities than treasuries. Mm -hmm. So they are very hungry for corporate bonds. Corporate bonds issued by publicly traded companies, there are big companies, big U.S. companies, even big non-U.S. companies that are literally creating a bond offering so a pension can buy it and get a slightly higher yield than a treasury. And by slightly, I mean just slightly higher yield. So there is an enormous demand uh, from pension and endowments to buy corporate bonds. 
I've even heard that many of them over the past couple of years have reached out to, you know, Apple and Amazon and all these gigantic companies to say, hey, I just want to let you know, if you do a bond offering, we're going to buy it. Yeah. So if you're thinking about it, hurry up because mm -hmm. we want your bonds. Yeah. So there is an enormous amount of corporate cash created, right? So you yeah. issue a bond, an endowment buys it or a pension fund buys it. Now you're the company, you're sitting on a mountain of cash. Yes. You need to deploy that. So there is a reason why these companies are more resilient today. All this cash um, and all this wealth is a good reason why maybe we haven't gone into that recession because there's so much money out there. It's a unique situation that we have. And it it really is providing sort of a rail, protecting us from um, you know economic, uh, really bad economic situations. Buffer. There's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of cash, there's a lot of money out there, both in the hands of corporations and people. Yeah. Uh, shockingly high uh, amount of money. Yeah, so there's an opportunity from both perspectives. And I, I think just one more clarification on this from a consumer perspective that you mentioned in that it sets the tone, not only in the short term, but possibly the mm -hmm. longer term. If you're looking at this slide, it shows what happens after the Fed has ended their hike cycle. Yeah. And the, the left-hand side shows cash in the dark blue one year following relative to poor bonds, poor bonds, more than double cash in one year following. Uh, you Then you look at U.S. stocks more to the right, which almost quadruple the return. And then even a blended portfolio on the far right uh, almost triples that return. So that's over one year. But then this slide goes even further to say, well, what happens in the next five years? And you can see a very similar tone where Bonds, stocks, and even a blended portfolio far outperform cash. So I think there's an opportunity here, not just in the short term, but it sets that stage for the longer term as well. So Agreed. And we've been saying over the past uh, six months or so in these videos that we do that, uh, you know, cash is king for a moment. And yeah. usually cash, the year that cash is king, it's because everything else, uh, you know, was either negative or flat and that was 2022 and usually the year following cash is the worst investment and it doesn't mean it it's negative because cash doesn't go negative but relative to everything else uh we let off this presentation with the full chart of all asset classes and cash was on the the very bottom of the list so there are better homes for cash and there will be for for quite some time. So uh, we do like the absolute return of cash right now. So, you know, for most of our clients, we might have a little bit more than we normally have. We have some bonds that are starting to mature. All of that is going to be put back into your um, your normal asset allocation. Cash is going to be a yielding security where the yield goes down uh, throughout the year. It is the most sensitive to the change in uh, Fed rates because it is the shortest term investment that you can have, it's cash. So typically within five to seven days, if the Fed cuts rates, your money market yield is going to go down within, you know, roughly within a week or so. Whereas there isn't as much impact to, or really negative impact any to uh, longer dated securities. If anything, those securities rise in value. So it's a, uh, you know, critical moment here and uh, something we're, we're, we're ready for. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit, Bob, about some specific areas of the market this year that we think could be an opportunity. Yeah, we believe that small cap stocks, smaller companies are going to outperform larger companies this year and potentially for a couple of years moving forward. We do think that large companies are going to do completely fine. They're going to do very well. But the opportunity, the discount that exists relative to large companies when you look at small companies is as wide as you can get. You have to go back to the tech bubble of 99, 2000, 2001 to find small companies this cheap. This one is, uh, we feel very strongly about. Now, I warn everybody, you're never going to be, um, you're never going to have a portfolio that's more exposed to small companies versus large companies. Why? Small companies are more volatile. So, um, uh, small companies are like using hot sauce, right? You can't put lots of hot sauce on anything. Otherwise, you'll spoil the taste um, and it just becomes too spicy. Same thing with small cap investing. When I say we're adding, yeah, we're adding small percentages. We're going to get to an overweight in our terms uh, of small cap 
relative to where we've been in small cap uh, sometime this year, we're going to stay there. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to overwhelm the portfolio. Exactly. I think that's a great point. It's never a decision of getting in or out. It's more dialing it up or down. And one other theme for, for this year in, in equities, I'll, I'll, I'll kick this idea off by just sharing what happened last year because it was so unique. If you're if you're looking at the slide on the left hand side, as we mentioned um, at the at the kickoff of this webinar, the stock market was so strong in 2023. In fact, if you're looking at that gray line, the S and P was up 24 percent. However, we spent a lot of time last year talking about the magnificent seven and the concentration. And just to give you an idea, the top 10 stocks last year, if you look at that green line, were up 62 percent. If you take those 10 stocks out of the S&P and you've got the 490 that are left, they were up eight. It was Perfect. one of the most concentrated returns we've ever seen. So the question we have to ask is, is that going to continue? Yeah, it was a great year to be concentrated in not diversified last year. But if you look over 24 months, your return would have been zero in those same stocks. Correct. Uh, because all the, the stocks that led the way down in 2022 are the top 10 stocks. Uh, so over 24 months, you didn't really make any money in those stocks. The bottom portion, or I should say the majority, the 490 of the S&P 500 companies, yeah, they they had a an average return, let's call it. There's lots of opportunity for them going forward. Um, there's opportunity for the, the biggest companies, the top 10 going forward, but the other S&P 500 the 490, I think there's probably more opportunity for uh, a bunch of them moving forward. Not to mention, they are cheaper. Their price to earnings ratio is quote unquote cheap. When you add the top 10 companies of the S&P to the other 490, you wrap it as the S&P 500, the PE ratio is, let's call it fair value. It's un just under 20. When you pull out those top 10, the fair value drops, it's discounted by 10%. There's opportunity in the S&P 500 490 uh, going forward. There's room to run for sure. And, and look, at the end of the day, it's like any race. There always has to be someone who leads the way. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear that it was the top 10 companies this past year that led the way. You already started to see a small rotation in the last two months of the year. All the other stuff, all those other good companies um, that that really weren't um, collecting as much money as you know the top ten from investors, uh, they started to wake up quite a bit. Yeah. So and we think that trend will will uh, continue throughout the next couple of years. There's always a lag with those, but that's good because it creates a a longer positive path. Yeah, and, and I think you're leading us into sort of that last idea in terms of stocks this year, and and some of the ones that were so you know that were more hurt last year were these were these dividend paying stocks. And, yeah. and I, I will say this, and, and, and you know, I love this slide, dividend paying stocks historically relative to the S&P trade at a discount. They trade historically at a 13% discount. That discount right now is double that. And at one point it went, the discount went all the way back to what we saw in the tech bubble, which to me is just mind boggling. So I, I think that's another reason to, to look at dividend paying stocks going forward. And I think one of the reasons they were so decimated more recently is as we talked about before, you know, there is competition in the market. And if you're getting 5% in money market, that that's competition for these dividend paying companies, right? Yeah. Yeah. To clarify, that's a great point. And I know you love this chart uh, and, and it's growing on me as you're talking. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I think a lot of uh, our investors, our clients are aware of the, um, the dividend paying stocks, they call them the bond proxies. They're not bonds, but they have a yield. So they kind of look like they're bonds. They they do well over long periods of time. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, they, they are known for their dividend. You know, the big dividend payers are known for their dividend. They're not known for their enormous earnings growth. They're not known to grow like Amazon or Apple, grow their earnings that quickly. But they reward you with um, a bond-like dividend right? So in a normal interest rate environment where rates kind of hover between a very tight band, uh, let's just call it normal, these bond proxy stocks, the dividend payers, the payers that are also growers, they do incredibly well. They also give you market return or very close to market return with less risks measured by the beta of the 
stock price relative to the market. However, there are there are two periods where they e either do much better than the market or much, much, much worse than the market. And this is really not even a reflection of the company. It's a reflection of the environment relative to what the company is offering. Okay. So they do very well when bond yields are very low. Mm -hmm. The bond proxy stocks, you know, I, I'll use a utility company, right? A highly regulated business in this country. Uh, earnings growth is actually capped, right? If you earn too much, you got to give refunds back to your, your customers, but they pay, you know, three to 6% dividend yields, depending on the company. When do you think they look good? They look good when you go out in the bond market and all you can get is two and a half percent. They're paying you three and a half percent. So let's buy the bond proxy stocks, the utility companies, because the yield is great and they have this pretty consistent earnings growth, right? We need electricity, don't we? So they look good in the low rate environment. They tend to actually outperform the market. In a normal rate environment, you know, you get slightly below average return, high dividend yield or high dividend growth, um, but you also get less price volatility, mm -hmm. right? So it's a much more conservative stock, generally speaking. They look bad when bond rates are high and the stock market is volatile. Why? Well, because when bond rates are high, just buy bonds to get the bond proxy yield. And, and in exactly. some cases, when bonds are very high, you'll get more yield with less risk, or in some cases, no risk by buying bonds versus buying a stock with a high dividend, in fact. So what happens? Well, money in motion, you sell the big dividend payers, or in this case, over the past couple of years, there's just no buying of the dividend theme. And there is buying. When, when you stop buying, where does the money go? The money went into the bond market. Right. So it's not that a lot of money came out of these dividend paying stocks. It just wasn't going in. That money was rerouted to buy bonds, to buy, you know, treasury bonds, corporate bonds at, you know, five and six percent yields. This is what we did as well. Now, you know, if you are a client of ours, you've got your fair share of dividend growth stocks and dividend payers. They're great. They're also on sale. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, I just said in a high rate environment, you know, price wise, they're not treated well, um, at least relative to the other parts of the market. But in a declining rate environment, those bond proxy stocks, those dividend paying stocks that look like they have a bond component to them, they don't, it's just a high dividend yield. They start to look more and more and more attractive. And we think this is another underrated, under discussed theme. A lot of the dividend payers and the dividend growers are also very cheap. Keep in mind, most of these companies wouldn't be paying a dividend if they couldn't afford it, and they're not growing earnings. Most of them are. They they look very attractive here. So this theme will start to play out quite well uh, probably over the next uh, uh, few years. And I say few years because that is the uh, what the Fed is saying is going to be their their path or their, their path. Path to yeah. cut rates. So, yeah. so and I, I think. Um, hopefully what what the listeners are getting from this is there's a few areas of the equity market that we see opportunity going into this year that's unique from last year. Yeah. And one one last point on the stock market, because I think this question has come up. A lot of, of clients and investors were surprised to see the year end rally with the market going higher than 10 percent over November and December. Uh, we do go back and take a look. That has happened uh, six previous times. And, you know, the question that arises, well, is it over? Right. Are we done? We just saw this rally. And, and the answer would be no. Uh, when you look at those six previous periods where the market rallied 10 percent in those last two months, the following quarter averaged 6.6 percent. And then the following year averaged 19 and a half. So there's momentum here that we think can continue. Yeah. If we just use history uh, and look back, uh, this is a very good setup. You don't have double digit returns in the last two months of the year that often you have good returns, but double digit returns, it's happened now, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. It's not luck and it's not a mistake. It's because there's value in the market and uh, it's, it's value in the market 
in our case now, it's also because we have um, monetary policy that is set to become less restrictive, which is a, a, a significant, significant positive for the mm-hmm. for the capital markets. Um, so there are even more reasons to be bullish. Absolutely. And, and I think one last area of opportunity for this year, um, we've talked about it before, but bonds are back. Bonds are back. Yeah, we, we our our theme again coming out of twenty twenty two into twenty twenty three was you know we're gonna we're gonna enter a bull market for stocks and bonds, uh, and we're right, and I think we're gonna continue to be correct here. Uh, keeping in mind, bull markets last uh, on average seven or eight years. A bear market lasts seven or eight months, so it's you know ten times as long. I know it doesn't feel that way. The impact of a change in rates of one percent. So in Fed talk, that would be four cuts. So if there are four cuts. This is just math. This is an opinion. This is just math. If there's a 1% uh, change in rates, 1% rise or fall, the rise is on the left-hand side, the fall is on the right-hand side. Uh, Generally speaking, the fall in rates creates positive price momentum for bonds, um, but it's more positive than you think. So you you look at 10-year treasuries, if there's a 1% cut in rates, you have a yield of right now of about 4%. About 60 days ago, it was 5%. Um, but you have the duration of the bond. Let's just softly call it the average maturity of those bonds in the portfolio multiplied times the change in rate gives you the upside price return. Then you add the yield to it. Wow. It's it's twice as good. Yes. A declining rate environment does wonders for the price of bonds. Yes. We have highlighted some areas. in uh, We shaded them on the left in a, let's call it a gray rectangle. 10-year treasuries, investment-grade corporate bonds, convertible bonds, U.S. high-yield bonds, and municipals, if we have this decline in rates, those bonds historically have provided double-digit positive returns in a declining rate environment. And again, this is assuming a full one-point change or four cuts. Um, If there's more, price return will, will be more. If there's less, price return will be a little bit less, but not negative. Yeah. How about that? Equity like return with less risk than owning stocks. Yes. And it's early on that you get these uh, better than expected returns in the cutting cycle. And it's usually the first and second year that you see the the full impact price wise in a declining rate environment. Yeah. It's a great opportunity. If there's ever time to own bonds, it's when rates are high and they're cutting and we think they're there. So thank you for that. Lots to talk about for the entire year. We're very excited few things. The market is going to be volatile the way it always is. It's volatile for a reason. That's If you can ride the volatility, that's where you get the return. If you can't ride the volatility, you'll get no return. That's just the way it is. So we look forward to that volatility. We look forward to explaining what it is, why it's happening, and how we're taking advantage of it. Uh, But it should be a very good year. Don't be impatient. We illustrated to you earlier that returns come in bunches. It never just comes slowly and consistently. That's a dream. We are realistic. Returns come in bunches, just like losses come in bunches. But don't worry, over time, there are more gains than losses over time. Um, it, it, again, should be a good year where we think in the second inning of a bull market that has years to go. And you should feel good about that. So, Well, I hope the listeners can sense it. I think that's a great summary. And uh, as always, Bob, we appreciate the insight. And thank and- you, everybody. And thanks everyone for listening. And as always, please reach out if you have any questions to any of us here at Principal Wealth Partners. Great. Thank you.